Let me see if I can, there we go. So you know who we are. We're in the Depart Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences here at Clemson uh, in the north uh, west corner of South Carolina. I'm a professor and extension specialist in plant pathology and Linus is my lab man manager and a plant pathologist. Uh, I do most of the grubbling for money and he does most of the work. Uh, that's a picture of our campus uh, with some morning fog and the building in which we're lo located. But please reach out to us if y'all have any questions after this uh, session is over. So what we'd like to cover, I'm going to review what we know about Phytophthora root and crown rot on lavender. And then Linus is going to talk to you about our ongoing project uh, to try and detect Phytophthora species on ornamental, uh, pardon me, on nursery grown ornamental plants early in the production process. So here I'll like to summarize what we know about Phytophthora root and crown rot on lavender here in the United States. We've been working on this disease since it was first reported by one of our growers in 2015. It's a national problem in the United States and it occurs in uh, many states across the country. It's primarily a problem for new growers and for nursery plants, and those two are very closely connected. So far, we know that there's four species of lavender that can be affected by Phytophthora root and crown, crown rot, primarily English lavender and hybrid lavender, which are the main uh, types of lavender being grown for commercial venture. English lavender seems to be the most susceptible of the two, but we've also had this disease show up on Spanish lavender and sweet lavender. And here's a Spanish lavender plant on the left that's got typical symptoms of Phytophthora root and crown rot. We see grain of the foliage, dying back of individual shoots. And if you pull those plants out of the ground, you'll see uh, root and crown rot, typical that uh, what we see on other plants. So far, we have at least eight species of Phytophthora associated with this disease. By far, Phytophthora nicotiani is the most common one we find. Phytophthora pulvivora has probably been the second most common one, but we also have found Phytophthora cactorum, Phytophthora cinnamomi, P. citrophthora, cryptogea, drexlerii, and megasperma, and we need to do the molecular identification. We may also have isolates of Phytophthora tropicalis. Now, the little box on the right tells you some of these are more tropical species or subtropical species. They prefer warmer climates, and those are the ones in red. And some of these are more prevalent in cooler climates, and those are the ones in blue. Most of you may know that lavenders typically grow in cool, dry climates. Um, the hub of lavender production in the United States was in the Pacific Northwest. It has since spread around the country. And here's a map of the United States that shows you where we have received samples here at Clemson over the last six years started in our home state of South Carolina with a sample from a local grower. And we've since, we collaborate with the U.S. Lavender Growers Association, U.S. LGA, and um, work with their growers. And we've opened up the Clemson Diagnostic Clinic in our lab to lavender growers to submit samples. And so far we have received samples from 27 states. We have over 450 isolates of Phytophthora species from lavender. Um, sometimes we get multiple growers from individual states. We sometimes get multiple species from a single site. So it gets to be a pretty complicated net network. We're reaching out all the time to get more samples from states where we haven't received samples yet. So this disease primarily affects new growers and nursery plants. And the question is, why is that? It's because the main source of inoculum is contaminated plants coming from nurseries. And I think that's why we were invited. We all have this common theme that's going on with Phytophthora being distributed on nursery grown plants. 
Nicotiani is the most common one we find on Laver, and so far none of the fields we have sampled uh, before the lavender was planted have any background population of Nicotiani, which helps cement our notion that these are truly introduced pathogens, and we do find them repeatedly on nursery grown plants before the lavender plants get to the field. So what does this all mean to us and to the growers? It means that contaminated plants will contaminate the soil in those fields once they're put in there. Contaminated fields can affect lavender production for many, many years. We have a number of new growers that have gone out of business before they started business because their plants have all died and their fields are now con contaminated. Survival of these different pathogens depends on where they are in the United States. Some of our subtropical species like Nicotiani and Palmebra don't survive winter climates. And we have another student working on that part of the project. The verdict is still out on some of those things. So what's the solution to this problem that we've been promoting to the growers? And that's to buy plants from reputable sources that you know have clean plants. Finding clean plants in a commercial nursery has been a tremendous challenge. The other thing we're recommending and where we are right now in our lab is we've recommended that they test plants before planting out in the field. And we've been working to develop a system to help the growers do, do that. What we're trying to avoid is this. These are two South Carolina lavender growers that planted new fields, new growers, and they ended up with most of their plants dead in the field because of Phytophthora root and crown rot. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linus and let him tell you about the program that we've started to help uh, uh, with early detection of Phytophthoras on lavender plants. And I'm gonna stop sharing and let Linus start sharing. Thank you. Can everybody hear me and see the slides? Yes, sir. Just go into slideshow. There you go. All right. So Dr. Jeffers just outlined. What? Linus, there you go. You're so good. Out and the challenges that lavender growers, and not just in the southeastern United States, but really across the country, are facing with Phytophthora. And here's what we need to do to address that issue. We would like to prevent introducing non-native photographers to growing operations, landscapes, and natural ecosystems so that we do not contaminate field sites. That where we would hope to limit crop loss and prevent future business closures. And unfortunately, this has also led to an increasing distrust between nurseries and lavender growers that needs to be repaired. So what we need are effective methods for early detection of Phytophthora species on nursery grown ornamental plants. And so oftentimes when we diagnose plant diseases, um, growers submit samples and sacrifice some of their plants. And oftentimes that happens after symptoms and signs develop. And the conclusions are made on the number, on relatively few um, sample numbers. So what we're suggesting instead is to collect a composite sample that consists of root clippings and potting mix from several plants in a tray, which is non-destructive and hopefully more representative of what's going on. We also don't need to wait for symptoms to appear and hopefully we will get an increased likelihood of detection. We also think that this method is adaptable and could be adopted by growers, nurseries, extension agents, and other service labs. And so our idea is based on several assumptions. One is that in nurseries and greenhouses, inoculum is likely to be spread by splashing water. Then as you can see in this picture on the left, plants at the edge are more likely to be contaminated first, with surrounding plants getting infected afterwards. 
And then lastly, we think that propagules of Phytophthora are most likely to be found at the bottom of those cells. So in each situation, what we do is develop a sampling scheme based on the layout and cell count of a tray of young plants. And then each cell that is not sampled is adjacent to at least one that is sampled, which are the red cells. To sample, we remove a plant from its cellar pod, and then with clean scissors, we cut the bottom five millimeter of those roots off and collect them as a composite sample. And you put that plug back in the tray to continue growing. Again, this is a non-destructive method. And then all from, run, from, uh, from one tray are collected into a zip to close bag. And so far this has proven to be a pretty straightforward and easy method for nursery to, nurseries and growers to submit samples. And then that composite sample gets suspended in water and baited with leaf pieces of rhododendron and camellia. And those are incubated for 72 hours. And then afterwards, we played out these baits on a selective medium and monitored them for growth of Phytophthora species. But what if there is no growth? Does that mean that there's no Phytophthora on those samples? Uh, we found out that fungicides or fungicide residues may actually inhibit detection because a lot of those active ingredients for oomycetes are what we call fungostatic. They just inhibit growth of Phytophthora, but they don't actually kill propagules. And then once that residual activity wears off, the pathogen will continue to grow and regain its infectious potential. So to determine if a sample does have those inhibiting residues, what we do is take plugs of a Phytophthora colony and then submerge these in water from those bait boxes. If there are no inhibitory residues, then sporangia should be produced readily within 12 to 24 hours, which you can see on the right. However, if there are any inhibiting residues, they know where only few sporangia are produced, which you can see on the left. So, so far, lavender girls have been encouraged to submit samples to us or to the plant diagnostic clinic after receiving plants from the nursery, but before planting them in the field. So far, we've processed 59 samples, including 18 cultivars of English and hybrid lavender and plants originally came from six nurseries in three states. Of those samples, eight samples or 14% tested positive. And we are primarily recovering Phytophthora nicotiani, but we also have other species like Cactorum and one that keeps popping up here lately that looks like Cryptogea, but we need to do some DNA sequencing to confirm that. So this means that four out of the six nurseries distributed infested plant material, but then on 20% of these samples, we did find inhibiting residues. So these samples are really inconclusive because we don't know whether they're truly negative or false negative. So we're trying to get to the root of this problem. And what we would like to do within the next couple of months is determine sensitivity of this sampling technique. So we're gonna do some greenhouse studies with different levels of infection. And then we would like to investigate commonly used fungicides for their residual and inhibitory activity. Um, I think we got some time for questions. Feel free to reach out and connect. And thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Steve and Linus. We do have five minutes and there's a question for, from Ted. What Phytophthora species is used for the sporangium production bioassay for fungicide residue? Can either of you answer that? Yes, we use uh, Nicotiani that we've identified morphologically and molecularly previously. And we also, so whenever we do this, we do or we do use both the bait water and then we also have a positive control 
with just non-sterile soil extract solution so that we can compare the two as far as range of production goes. And just, just to follow up on that, yeah. is that you've got to already checked that your isolate is, is, is fully susceptible to the fungicides. I mean, you don't have resistant isolate to start with, right? Correct, correct, yes. So we are, yes, we also determine mifanoxin resistant at least. Yeah, and so, so, it's, the, so it's mainly mefenoxin we were looking at, right? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, and that's part of our project is to look at what the other oomycete specific fungicides do in this assay and what effects they have. And Ted, the bottom line is we can you can use any phytophthora that you have actively growing that sporulates readily. Cinnamomy is not a good choice because it doesn't produce sporangia very, it's not very cooperative under lab, laboratory settings. All right. If there's any other question, yes, we have something from Susan. Any idea why lavender is so susceptible? Have you looked at other herb type woody plants? Um, no, we haven't because this isn't really been an herb project. Uh, this whole project stemmed out of a, a new grower that's located about 50 miles from campus that got in touch with us in the summer of 2015 because all the lavender plants they had recently purchased from three different nurseries were dying in their field. And the project kind of mushroomed from a regular extension call to a full-blown research project that's now gone on for six years. Uh, the more we got into this, the more we found. But there are reports in the literature that Rosemary and um, certainly Salvia, uh, members of Salvia uh, genus are also susceptible. But obviously, this is a widespread problem in nurseries, and uh, lavender merely serves as kind of a model system to study this whole problem that we're all fully aware of, of phy phytophthoras being grown and propagated in the nursery and disseminated free with the plants that you're buying. It's very generous of the growers to give away a free product like that. Yes, yes. I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker, but if something comes up as we're going through, um, please put it in the chat and we can come back to Steve and Linus. Yes, but for and now, we'll stay, Janice, we'll stay here for the duration. Well, perfect. We love to have you. Uh, the next speaker we have is Ebba Peterson from Oregon State University, and she's going to be giving um, a talk about her results of a phytophthora study at MidPen. Take it away, Ebba. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Oops, I lost my presentation. There we go. Great. So today I'll be presenting results from a Phytophthora diversity study that we performed at the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Now, this should be a very familiar story. The uh, exchange of phytophthoras from nurseries to outplantings to wildlands, of course, most of this being from nurseries into these native environments. And this is problematic in as much as not only do we not really know what these species are doing in our wildlands, but we also don't even know necessarily what's already out there, what their distribution is, what phytophthora species are we finding. And so this first and foremost was the goal of the project, which was to survey for phytophthora diversity across mid-peninsula lands. And this is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, just south of San Francisco. And we surveyed 38 future and um, current restoration projects located across 10 different preserves, with the goal to identify the extent of infestation and ultimately to di help direct future management to reduce the impacts and spread of phytophthora. So we had three different site types as part of this project. The first was a revegetation site or a reveg project. And these are areas where we actually introduced, sorry, where uh, nursery plants had actually been taken and planted out in the field. So here we have three distinct hey. reveg projects. Yeah? Oh, uh, three distinct reveg projects here at the Skyline Ridge. Now, in many cases, we had disturbed unplanted sites. These are either planned projects or adjacent disturbed areas. This is a operational Christmas tree farm at Skyline Ridge. And then for each of these reveg or disturbed areas, we had a corresponding control site. 
which was ideally the same vegetation, but also minimal disturbance relative at least to these particular areas. So over two years, we collected 564 soil samples, and we also collected vegetation and baited streams. So the soil is processed two different ways. The first was a very classic baiting technique. You flood the soil, introduce a bait, in this case, a green pear that the Phytophthora can infect. We can grow this Phytophthora into culture. And to identify it, we extract the DNA and compare it to a reference database to say, oh, this one is Phytophthora cinnamomy. Now, alumina mice seek high throughput sequencing. This is a fairly new technique. It skips the baiting altogether. And instead, you extract the DNA right out of the soil. Um, so this gives you um, a series of short sequences that, again, you compare it to a reference database. And here you can see this blue one corresponds to cinnamomy. This yellow one, yellow orange one, goes to Phytophthora syringi. syringi. Um, but again, these are only DNA sequences. And since we don't have an actual pathogen growing in culture, we call them operational taxonomic units, or OTUs, which is a DNA sequence that can be classified as one particular species. Now, these DNA sequences actually have to match something in our database. They don't always. And then there's another problem with this method whereby the sequences are so short that oftentimes we can't differentiate between species, in which case we have clusters or complexes. So the Phytophthora nemorosa cluster actually might be any one of these particular species. But this method is, um, has some benefits in as much that you can actually detect multiple species or OTUs in a sample and is very sensitive. So to give you an example of what we might see with these two different methods, I'm going to show you the Polis Ridge Forest site. Here we have a reveg project and the corresponding control samples. And I'm just going to show you um, the distribution of Phytophthora cactorum. So that particular species was only baited once from this sample here in the reveg site. Now via Illumina, it was detected at this sample, but also over here, as well as in the control area, indicating this particular species might be more widely distributed. So with the baiting, we actually baited 18 Phytophthora species, an additional two species were recovered only from foliage. Of these 20, one species has never been reported in North America, one species has never been found outside of restoration plantings, and we found one provisionally new species. Unfortunately, aggressive species were baited in all preserves and all site types, that being the re-veg disturbed and control areas. But we think that we found a high rate of false negatives. That is, we suspect Phytophthora is there, but we were unable to bait it. And we know this because many species were only detected in one year, um, particularly those species that we know to be fairly widespread. And very few samples were repeat positive. So we did go back both years to some um, areas and sampled the same plant, and very rarely did we find the same Phytophthora both years. With Illumina, we found 34 distinct Phytophthora OTUs. Of these, 19 were not baited. Now, this means one of two things. Either this represents an unbaitable species, so not all um, Phytophthora species are easily baited or not all of them go to the baits that we were using, but it also might um, represent just a non-viable DNA-only detection. So there might have been an introduction, say a spore was introduced, that spore never caused an infection, it broke down and leaked its DNA into the soil. That might be what we're detecting in this case, but we can't differentiate between these two. Of the 34, 11 were only found in re and disturbed areas, and all of these were rare. This is very consistent with Phytophthora being introduced on nursery plants or via disturbance. Uh, presumptively native species were very common. This is very interesting because these species should be widespread and they shouldn't cause lots of disease. But as with the baiting, we did find aggressive species found in all the different site types. Now, when we're thinking about infestation, we actually really need to take into account the fact that we have both native species and aggressive species in our samples. And to do that, we came up with something called an infestation score that takes into two, um, two different components into account. First is the number of species found, the diversity at the site or in the sample, but also the relative risk posed by each species. So we combed through the literature and came up with a rating system from one to four, representing low to very high risk of um, for that Phytophthora species or OTU to cause disease in mid-peninsula lands. One, of course, being those native or those poor pathogens, all the way to four being those invasive pathogens that we're really concerned about. And the score is the sum of the ratings for all those species that we detected. So here we have Phytophthora cactorum at the Polgus Ridge site, but we also found Cadmia, Bomeria, Cinnamomy, and Cambivora with their respective ratings. You add all these together for a baiting score of 16. And then of course we can do this with all the Illumina detections 
for an Illumina score. And then the total infestation score is the sum of those two numbers. And what's really interesting is what we saw when we compared the baiting score with the Illumina score. So that's what I'm doing here. Here we have the baiting score um, compared against the Illumina score. In this case, for all of these samples taken from a given area, Here's the Polgus Ridge Forest site with a baiting score of 16 and a Lumina score of about 17. And this places it in this corner of sites that we consider to be highly infested. These are the areas where we found a large number of species, but also a diversity of these aggressive species that we're really concerned about. Contrast that with relatively clean areas in which fewer species were found or less aggressive species. And then we had sites that fall somewhere in between. And with Illumina, as we mentioned, and as you've seen, there's a lot more diversity, but it's also much more sensitive. And so we did find a large number of sites in which we didn't have good baiting success, but we did find high diversity with the Illumina. And again, we can't tell if these represent unbaitable species or if a species was introduced and it, we were just, we weren't able to, um, it wasn't able to establish. Um, so this is what Polgus Ridge Forest site looks like with these two pieces of information. And there's two things I want to point out. First is the color indicating the infestation score, anywhere from blue being a low um, infestation score to high. And then the size of the circle for each of these samples indicates the number of OTUs that we detected. And you can see that you're finding a lot of diversity and high risk species here in the Reveg project, as well as, as in this adjacent forest. Um, and this plays out too with the baiting. So here's where we baited Phytophthora cactorum. Here's where we found Bomeriae. And then over here in the forest, we found Cadmia, Campivora, and we also found Phytophthora cinnamomi. So we consider this to be a highly infested site. Um, pretty much wherever you go, you do find some measure of Phytophthora infestation. Contrast this with one of our lightly infested sites. This is the flagpole planting at Sierra Azul. Here's the control area with some very high risk genera. Um, that we've seen lots of Phytophthoras on, things like coffee berry, manzanita. Um, here we have samples taken from a heavily disturbed area, um, lots of soil movement, as well as ornamental plantings. And then here's the Reveg project. And you can see in this particular location, all the Phytophthora diversity is really concentrated here at this Reveg project. And indeed, when you look at the baiting, this is also where we find the Phytophthoras. So in conclusion, um, we did find that nursery grown plants have been a source of Phytophthora in mid-peninsula lands. Phytosphere has done a lot of really great work on this in this area. Um, we did observe that Phytophthoras are impacting mid-peninsula preserves and that some areas were very infested. But in uh, a little cue of hope, uh, we did find that Phytophthora species, they're not ubiquitous. Um, some Phytophthora species have very limited distribution and that some areas were also minimally infested. In many cases, when Phytophthora were present, they were largely limited to revegetation areas. So with that, um, I would like to thank everyone in the Park Lab, um, especially, of course, Jennifer, but also Neelam Redekar and Joyce Eberhardt, who did a large component of this project, as well as people at the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Um, I saw Cindy on the line, so this was kind of the brainchild of a uh, her as she was um, taken off. So it's good to see you. And with that, I will take your questions. Thanks, Eppa. We have one question in here from Johanna. Mm -hmm. Do you think the baits selected play a role in selecting certain Phytophthora species? Uh, the answer is yes, it absolutely does. Um, it's particularly if you're targeting specific types of species. So, um, Every species in our sample was baited with the green pear, and that picks up a large number of species, but we were also targeting Phytophthora tentaculata and Phytophthora quercina. And for those, we were also using um, oregano and, um, uh, oh, oak radicals. I collected acorns and grew oak radicals to get at the quercina. And then in addition to that, we were using rhododendron as well. So in our particular case, we didn't see a huge difference between the different bait types, um, but in other studies, they have found some differences. And so it's recommended for baiting that multiple bait types be used, and then given the rate of false negatives that um, multiple years be tested. There's a question from Cindy about the comparison to other park districts, such as um, agencies like MMWD in Marin or SFPUC also on the peninsula. Yeah, let me see. 
Um, I can bring yeah, so I actually um, tabulated, I, I created a chart comparing the diversity that we found in comparison to all the other studies that have been published recently um, with the other groups like in SSPUD and Marin. Uh, everyone finds lots of diversity, unfortunately. Um, and I can sh uh, share that chart with you to see, well, which species are in common and which species are specific just to mid-peninsula lands. But I, I would say the general feeling is that Phytophthoras have been widely distributed across this whole area. And I think we have time for one more question. I'll take Michelle's. What's the range of years since planting in the reed veg sites? Do you have an idea of how long ago some of them were planted? Ooh, I do. I'd have to look that up to know for sure. Some of them have been as recent as like the winter before. Um, and some of them, I, I believe, are almost a decade before. It's, most of them are quite a while. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Eba. That's about time for right now, but we'll try to get back to some of these other questions. There was one from Diana we missed when Steve and Linus were talking, and there's a couple more for you, but we're going to see if we can get to them later. For great. now, I'm going to transition to our next speaker, um, who's going to be continuing this conversation about the Mid-Peninsula Open Space District. Amanda Mills is our next speaker. Amanda, you can feel free to share your screen and unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ebba, for that wonderful presentation. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District has been managing for these phytophthoras. So Mid-Peninsula Open Space District, also known as Mid-Pen, is an independent special district in the San Francisco Bay Area that has preserved over 65,000 acres of lands and manages 26 open space preserves. So just a quick timeline of our response to Phytophthoras. Back in 2005, we implemented a 10-year work plan to fund and conduct sudden oak death research in our preserves through treating specimen oak trees with preventative measures such as fungicide applications and bay tree removals, as well as mapping potentially resistant trees and tan oak resistant studies. We also started to provide staff trainings and implemented best management practices and updated our contract language to help minimize the spread of sudden oak death. So in 2014, after we learned of the soil-borne phytophthoras, we stopped all of our native plant nursery stock installation in our preserves for several years until we can learn more about this issue. And in 2016, we provided a sudden oak death research 10-year update to our board and public and outlined an additional 10-year work plan to continue to fund and conduct sudden oak death research and develop sudden oak death response plans for heavily infested sites to complete restoration and wildfire fuel reduction, as well as the soil borne phytophthora research that Oregon State University completed. So after we detected um, some positive tests for phytophthora, soil borne phytophthora in several of our reveg sites, we really saw the need to do a more robust survey and sampling and testing of our preserves. So we worked with Oregon State University to, to do this, and they began testing and sampling our reveg sites back in 2017. But before they could do that, we really needed to compile all of our revegetation information as far back as 30 years, I believe it was, um, just so we could have everything in one central location. So our GIS team came up with an application that allowed us to map all previous and new reved sites and tie any planting information to these um, reveg polygons. And we can also um, attach documents like planting plans and specifications. So it's been really helpful to have this as a tool and have everything in one central location. Um, our GIS team also set up an application to help us track all of the results from the sampling and testing that Oregon State completed. And you can see from the screenshot that each sample and test result has a unique ID and includes information on the um, sample, the species sample, the um, 
Phytophthora species that was detected, as well as the baiting and alumina scores and total infestation ranks that OSU compiled. And this has been really useful to help inform our staff on Phytophthora presence prior to conducting any field work and during the project planning process. So since 2016, we've worked really closely with our native plant suppliers to ensure that all of our, our, our plants for reveg projects are grown utilizing the phytosanitary best management practices that include things like heat treating soil, sanitizing plant containers, um, raising the plants up off the ground on the benches like you see here in the photos, and regular inspections and a wide variety of other measures to minimize our risk. So all of our plants are now tested for phytotheras prior to being outplanted. And since 2017, we began to install nursery plants grown with these BMPs that test negative at our restoration and mitigation sites, following some guidelines that we put together to minimize phytothera contamination that were compiled from the, the BMPs that the working group for phytotheras in native habitats had developed and a few other sources. Um, so these BMPs require that we clean and sanitize all tools, equipment, and boots with a proper disinfectant prior to and after each outplanting. And that includes any wheel, wheeled equipment or vehicles that are used to transport tools and plants. So here's a few of our volunteers demonstrating our boot cleaning BMP. We did put together some sanitation kits that include boot brushes and 70% isopropyl alcohol spray bottles that um, allow them to clean the tools and boots and their boots prior to and after each project. And of course, we always stress the importance to our volunteers and staff of arriving clean and leaving clean from project sites to minimize the spread of pathogens, but also um, invasive weed species as well. So another way we've been minimizing our risk is by direct seeding at revegetation sites. We've moved to direct seeding of oak acorns and California buckeye seeds at some of our sites and have seen a lot of success with this method. Um, we also follow our BMPs for collection activities as well as installation. And some of the collection BMPs include not um, collecting from the ground, collecting from healthy plants and trees, um, making sure you collect with clean and sanitized tools, not collecting during wet or muddy conditions, and also cleaning your seed as soon as possible. And in addition, we do have additional propagule site identification surveys and mapping underway to assist us in increasing these direct seeding efforts in the future. We've also worked closely with our staff contractors and consultants to plan and implement projects to minimize our risk for introducing Phytophthora species. And early coordination is extremely critical. We coordinate with our planners and engineering construction and field staff to review project plans and specifications to make any adjustments where needed, and also ensure that BMPs and contract language outline requirements for projects to minimize our risk. So some of the construction BMPs that we include in our agreements include inspection of equipment upon arrival to, to the site to make sure it's clean and sanitized. And we will turn away equipment if it has not been clean and there's obvious um, mud clop, clods and other vegetation on it. Um, we require daily sanitation logs, cleaning stations and kits on site, and also the sanitation of all their tools and equipment. And we're also limiting the importation of materials like soil, which is one of the higher risk activities associated with Phytophthora introduction and spread. So we received Oregon State University's final research report in 2020 at the end in um, December. And their report outlined a lot of the Phytophthora management principles that include exclusion and prevention, protection and suppression, and eradication and resistance. So the recommendations for the management strategies outlined in the exclusion and prevention will help us minimize our potential for the introduction of any new Phytophthora species. And we've already implemented a lot of these techniques and BMPs, but we will need to continue to plan and implement projects in a manner that help minimize our risk. 
And exclusion is especially important to protect our minimally infested areas, as well as sensitive sites that are known to host special status species. But of course, it's important to do this everywhere. The protection and suppression management strategies will require ongoing monitoring and testing at our new revegetation sites and other strategies to help us reduce risk factors, such as considering our planting densities, avoiding planting vulnerable species and completing periodic health assessments in heavily infested sites as well as minimally infested sites. And once phytophthoras are introduced to a site, it is extremely difficult and costly to implement some of these eradication strategies like solarization and heat treatment of soils. It also requires long-term monitoring to ensure it's successful. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Resistance breeding is also one of the long-term methods to help determine if there are species that may be resistant to Phytophthora species like sudden oak death. And this is something that we have started to experiment with at some of our restoration sites that are located in sod-infested preserves. We've started to collect acorns for installation that we map and track the parent tree, and we hope over time that we may see potentially that there are resistant trees within some of these heavily infested sod areas. So MidPen's next steps for management of phytophthoras are to develop more robust BMPs for district staff and contractors. We'll also begin the development of remediation and project implementation plans based on Oregon State's site-specific recommendations. We'll continue to plan and implement prevention and exclusion and protection and suppression management strategies. And also we'll begin to develop and implement an ongoing testing program for any of our new revegetation sites, which will be really critical to continue to minimize the potential for introduction and spread of these pathogens. And with that, that is all I have for you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda. There is a question from the California Native Plant Society. Do you get positive results for Phytophthora when you test deliveries from your suppliers? Um, well, in the earlier years when we first started implementing these BMPs, we were seeing some positive hits and we've also had positive hits for Pythium species. So we would not, um, we, we wouldn't accept these plants and we just decided to either delay the project and grow another year. Um, but the testing really has been successful as well as the BMPs. In recent years, we really haven't seen um, positive hits um, for phytophthoras. So the BMPs really are working. And then another short question from Steve. He's curious how you formed your relationship with Oregon State University rather than a university or research closer to you on the peninsula. Well, we attended the Sudden Oak Death Conference, I believe it was back in 2016, and Cindy Ressler was really the one that spearheaded this project, so thanks, big thanks to Cindy. So we, we provided a summary of, of the potential um, work and requested proposals from several different um, universities that were interested, but um, Oregon State University were was the team that we decided to go with based on their proposal. Great, and I think one last question from Carrie. Are your BMPs available to other land managers? And secondly, what species of trees are you collecting for resistance monitoring? Um, well, we've actually been compiling our BMPs, kind of piecemealing them together for projects, which is why we really do need to complete a more robust document, but we've been utilizing the BMPs from groups like the Calphytos or the Native Phytophthora as a Native Habitats Working Group. I know there are several other agencies that have BMPs that are available online, so we've basically been compiling our BMPs based off of other agencies' BMPs. Um, as for the oaks that we're collecting acorns from, they include coast live oaks, canyon live oaks. Um, those are really the two, um, the, the species that we collect from most. 
That's great. Thanks so much, Amanda. I'm going to save this question from Krista so we can move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Ted Swicky of Phytosphere Research, and he's going to be giving us an overview of some heat treatment alternatives. Go ahead, Ted. All right. Am I audible? Yes. And you can see my screen? Yes. Why no? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little potpourri on some, some hot things related to heat treatment. Um, and it kind of follows up on a lot of the things we've already been talking about. A few heat treatment basics. Uh, heat's a good thing to, to kill stuff. If you get hot enough, you can kill pretty much anything. But we do have, have different organisms that can tolerate different heating levels. So we can use selectivity in some cases if we're not trying to kill everything. But one of these, these well-established numbers, 640F or 60C for 30 minutes, it's pretty much a standard that we use for, for BMPs and for other uh, clean production types of situations. Um, I think to remember is that temperature and time uh, for thermal kill have a log relationship rather than a linear relationship. So if you drop the temperature even a little bit, you have to increase the time proportionally quite a bit more. If we're using discontinuous heating for things like solarization, um, those heat cool cycles mean you need more time overall. And in general, there's two things related to moisture. Moist heat requires less time to, at a given temperature for kill than, than does dry heat. And that's partly related to, to the propagule hydration as well, because if you have hydrated propagules, they'll kill in less time than dry dormant propagules. So those are all things to keep in mind as we're talking about some of these other things. I'm going to talk a little bit about some solar ovens and this uh, rotating heat drum heater. Um, both those uh, involve uh, funding from Santa Clara Valley Water District. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little preliminary data about uh, thermal therapy of live plants, and that's from PUC uh, funded research. Um, there's a lot of backstory on this one, but I won't have time to go into it, but we had some, a site with we're solarizing infested plants, ding sites. Uh, we found by instrumenting them that we were getting good heating in some places, not so good heating in other places. The hours at, at these higher temperatures were relatively low. And we couldn't really instrument all these for temperature, but we realized that because it was proportional to light intensity, we could just move around some light sensors and look at the lighting profiles at these different sites to identify those where there is shading problems that were causing to us to have less light at these higher intensity levels above 16K at this, on this scale. Um, and so we were able then to, to look at um, from both by doing isolations from these sites and then looking at the light intensities, establish a floor below which we couldn't be sure that these were solarized properly and above which we were sure that we, we didn't have a problem. And so we couldn't really bring the, the sun to these sites, but we could bring the sites to the sun, but we want to heat them up um, in something that, we, that is contained, and that's a solar oven. So here at Phytosphere um, Oven Manufacturing, we put together some ovens that were made to be used in the field they were portable in little flat sheets, and then they were popped together with a few bolts in the field. Um, the sites that were needed to be treated were excavated into these, these um, cans, which were then put in the ovens, and then they're covered with uh, greenhouse film so you don't end up with condensation on the inside of the, the glass oven. Um, and these are some heating curves showing that we were getting pretty good heating. This next graph shows you one of the relationships that we see that uh, you get your peak light, of course, centered around soil or noon. Um, air temperatures in the oven tend to be just a little lagged beyond that, but soil temperatures inside of these vessels ends up being lagged by actually several hours. And that's fairly common because the, the heat wave sort of moves its way in to the soil and then it takes a long time for it to actually dissipate. So, uh, and if you actually have and light intensity is really important here. If we have a cloudy day, you can see how much we've, we've dropped if we compare that one to this one. You see how the heating hours have dropped. But we're looking for heating above various thresholds. We actually established thresholds. And because we have multiple days out there, we 
we can we can say okay we will only pull the soils after it's been cooked sufficiently and, and it had passed various heating thresholds um, and that that can be done by just monitoring the temperature in these things um, that's one kind of oven it was made with one inch wall insulation um, this is another little oven that we use locally here where we actually bumped up the insulation to two inch and this one uses the same size glass but it actually has a has a lower internal volume so it's more efficient oven and you can see we can get um, temperatures up to hot enough to boil water inside of these things um, this particular thing this particular oven uh, you can see at midsummer we're we're at eight plus hours above uh, 60 C so that's plenty enough to cook just about anything you want to um, and if you have an efficient oven you can use it later in the season so here um, this was just taken a couple of days ago, and we still have more than six hours above 60 C in this oven. So we've been encouraging a lot of our air program nurseries to where they have a lot of solar resources, you know, make an oven. You can, you don't have to cook everything using energy that uh, you have to burn carbon for. You can, you can use the sun. And uh, Ernesto Alvarado down at the RCRCD um, made this nice oven out of uh, an old recycled window from the salinity lab, which is where that's located. Um, nice uh, collection area to total volume ratio there. Um, another site in Santa Clarita, another one of our nursery sites is getting going for the air program. So well, we got some hot stuff out here. We got these shipping containers. And so we said, okay, well, we'll go ahead and put some thermometer in there and put the, use these uh, thermo tent strips. And you can see it, we're getting up to 130 Fahrenheit, but he said, but you know, the, the greenhouse is going to be really hot. And yes, it was. You can see that we're up to 180 air temperatures in the greenhouse. So that was clearly the winner. And uh, they've been using that. You can basically put your containers, fill them with moist soil, put them in the greenhouse. And if we look at these temperature curves, these are outside temperatures down here. These upper temperatures are what they're reaching in the greenhouse, air temperatures. And then these smoother curves are the soil temperatures they're reading and the north and middle of the oven or the, or the oven, which is, which is the greenhouse. Um, they were getting plenty of heating there. The uh, south side, a little bit less. There's a little sh internal shading inside the greenhouse there. So it's important that you have light impaction there. It's also, again, important if you're going to moisten the soil that you tarp it with something clear plastic so that you don't lose all the moisture and have evaporative cooling. Okay, so if we don't have enough solar energy, there's lots of other things we can use. And a lot of people use steam heating as a perfectly effective way to use uh, heat stuff up. It takes a little bit more equipment than, than uh, you would like to be able to have to use. Um, and if you're working a site like this, this was a restoration planting site out in an you know, area where we don't have enough solar energy to put an oven out because too much shading. But these planting sites infested with a number of different Phytophthora species are out there. So we're looking at some possibilities for more portable types of uh, smaller scale heating devices. And so we worked on basically this little prototype here, which is a, which is a rotating drum, which uh, is then uses dry heat from, from this heater here, but that dry heat is going into moist soil, so it's actually creating a moist heat environment. But the important part about this device is that it mixes, and mixing improves the uniformity of heating, so you don't have hot spots and cold spots, and it also increases the overall heating efficiency. And part of that is because we have convective heat transfer, not just conduction, which you have in a static system. So we actually had prototyped this system out a couple of years earlier um, using this kind of hand turn barrel. And although that looks pretty primitive, if you take a look at that, you'll see that's exactly the same design as a rotary kiln or a rotary dryer. Um, and these are well-known industrial devices. They're much more heat efficient um, and they're made for, for basically heating granular material. And that's what we're doing for heating soil or potting mix. So we do need to maintain some moisture in here. So it turns out that because we're using dry heat and we're flushing this air back out of the system, we have to add a certain amount of water. We've used a mist nozzle and just brought that into the airflow. And after we have a heating event, we pull off this collar, dump it into an insulated vessel, 
and allow that material to remain hot for some period of time. These heating curves are from the uh, different trials with this with the device with different slightly different configurations. But the bottom line is we're heating these the soil up to above uh, 55 degrees within a within 20 to 25 minutes, and that's 55 C. And if we had better insulation on the drum as we increased our insulation amount, we had a little better efficiency. We found that actually there was a sweet spot for, for soil moisture. If it was too dry, it actually took longer to heat because you weren't getting that, that uh, effect of, of steam in there. And the uh, air temperatures and starting soil temperatures really didn't have much effect. We were putting a lot of heat on and that those other things just really didn't matter. Um, this is a little bit about the sweet spot of the moisture. We've got it right in this heavy clay loam we were test using for our test material you might get a little rounding of particles. But in our first couple of trials, whoops, we basically used to, we thought, oh, this is getting too dry. Would you just sprinkle a little water in there and I end up with a bunch of uh, clay balls there. So that's not what you want to do. Um, really, we used a very cheesy kind of insulated vessel there just to, for proof of concept. But the bottom line is you can see in this temperature graphs that we maintain temperatures for quite a long time after, after the heat input is stopped. And so you don't have to maintain a half an hour in the, in the burner there to keep it at that temperature. You just get above the temperature and have it in an insulated vessel and let it, let it basically sit there until it's had a long enough period of heat. And we were able to confirm efficacy on some, some native soil that we had infested with cactorum and when we heat treated it, we couldn't detect it. Okay, last thing I want to cover quickly is uh, um, thermotherapy, and this is something that's been around for a long time, and as I emphasized by Ken Baker's book here uh, for the UC system, the bottom line is that you're trying to kill the pathogen but not the host, and so you have to kind of fool around to figure out what that, you know, what that point is. Well, there wasn't really a lot of data for the types of plants we've been using, so uh, with some donated plants from uh, uh, Grassroots Nursery. We started out doing some, some heat tolerance things by just seeing what we could tolerate based off of literature that we thought what might be useful. And you can put these things in a, in a circulating water bath and it sounds pretty simple, but they float and you gotta bag them so that they don't, they don't cross contaminate each other or get saturated. And so there's actually quite a few little tricks involved with just even doing that. But when you do it, you can see that you've got much better heat tolerance on some species than others. And um, in this particular diagram, you'll see this, we have uh, from these, this, this is uh, 50 degrees, 45, 41 for different amounts of hours. And you'll see that one of these did not survive. That little tag there says flooded. And so if you have a situation where, the, uh, where you're flooded for that period, time, um, you're not going to tolerate the same amount of heat. So there's some real differences on what, how things have to be handled. We also wanted to check whether our pathogen was going to be eliminated at temperatures we, we wanted. And we wanted to start with some tissue infected material rather than something right off an auger plate or something. So we used some pear baits. We punched out this, put them in uh, test tubes and held them in water for periods of time. We ended up focusing on this 47C temperature, something that didn't take too long to treat, um, but was not, and it was also something that plants were surviving pretty well. And we didn't get any survival when we started at 20, 240 minutes, that's four hours, it's quite a long time. But as we took it down the pike, we actually found we could run it as little as 20 minutes and we had no survival with the inoculum. And we found that the temperature tolerance of these these pathogens is actually a lot less than you would think based off the literature. And we have some reasons why we think that's the case, but I won't go into that right now. Well, at this point, we're actually out of funding on this small project, but we did have to figure out whether this actually worked in, in, in practice. So we ran a quick uh, small scale study where we raised the temperature of, of these pots by pouring through water. If you just put it in a water bath, it takes hours for these things to reach temperature, it doesn't work. Then you can put it into the water bath and hold it at that temperature. And then the last thing you have to do is flush it with cold water. Otherwise your 
temperature period extends long beyond the point you want it to be. As it was, we were shooting for half an hour and our temperature duration was between 32 and 34 minutes. That's pretty good. And bottom line is that we used plants that were artificially inoculated at one point. They were baited um, five, 10, 15 days after inoculation. We had positive baits on all those in particular by the 15, all three species were positive. We heat treated them one or two weeks later. And from that point onward, we could not recover any Phytophthora. Um, and these are the plants at the end of the, the uh, study. At the very end, we destructively baited this material and got no recoveries. And um, the plants obviously are all surviving. Uh, we look at the roots. The roots are always dark on these things, so it's hard to tell much about them. But here's the heat treated one. You can see these are live roots here. And there's, there's actually some fungi growing in there. It's pretty happy looking soil. Um, this is an inoculated plant of similar age that had not been heat treated. So you can see that there's just really no live roots there left at all. So that little proof of concept shows, yeah, we can use heat treatment to eliminate some phytophthora root infections. Um, it's going to be really effective and feasible only for really small plants and propagules. Uh, as you get bigger, it becomes more and more difficult to, to manage these temperatures precisely. So it's gonna be used primarily in fairly specialized situations that we can talk about what those might be, but um, you can probably think of some. And beyond that, then you still have to do some work to make sure you've got the parameters for your specific plant and pathogen combination. Not all plants are gonna to tolerate the same temperatures. So um, that's something you just have to work with. And with that, hopefully I got through it without going over time. Thanks, Ted, that was great. Um, we are a little bit um, at our limit. And so this question from Steve, I'm gonna save, um, and we're gonna go ahead and go on to our next speaker, who is Johanna Del Castillo from UC Davis. She's already up and ready to go. Take it away, Johanna. She needs to un unmute herself. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hi. Sorry. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, presentation. I am project, I'm a project scientist here at UC Davis, and I start a greenhouse and nursery pathology program about two years ago. And so I went to the Cal Fire's meeting two years ago when I got to meet some of you, and that's how I got involved into working with this group. So what I'll be sharing today is that evaluating the efficacy of currently available phytophthora detection methods uh, to inform uh, restoration nurseries, because as all the talks we have seen, testing is a very important component for um, produce healthy plants. Okay, so well, as most of you are aware, here in California, around seven years ago, a new phytophthora species that haven't been found before were found for the first time at some failed uh, restoration projects. Um, and this uh, gave rise to investigate what other species were here. So it's like, First was this Phytophthora tentaculata that was identified in 2013 on a restoration, failed restoration site. And then this tracked back to sample at other restoration nurseries and Phytophthora tentaculata was found from these nurseries that provided the plants for the failed uh, restoration project. This was an alarm to start investigating what was happening here in the state. And the CDFA did a very complete survey where they recovered Phytophthora from 20 out of 26 nurseries that were surveyed. You can see all the different surveys in the uh, counties in the map that I'm showing. And the most prevalent species that were found uh, besides Phytophthora tentaculata were Phytophthora cacturum, the species in the Phytophthora cryptoja complex. And in terms of host, we know restoration nurseries have a wide diversity of plants 
but Toyon, Coffee Berry, Pacific Madrone, and California Wild Rose were the hosts with the higher frequency of Phytophthora uh, recovered. And this uh, survey identified more than 50 Phytophthora species being present here uh, in California. So with that, and since there were these Phytophthora outbreaks, so more people may be more aware than I because I joined just two years ago, this Phytophthora working group was created. And one of the main questions that we have uh, in this group is how to control the spread of Phytophthora. So of course we know the last thing we want is to introduce these Phytophthora species into restoration projects. So the main goal is prevent introduction and the best way to prevent this introduction is by testing plant materials in the nursery before they are sent to the forest. Uh, within this um, Phytophthora Working Group program, uh, working with uh, Ted Zwicky from Phytosphere, Susan Frankel, and other people involved in this project, we are also part of the accreditation program to improve restorations, a program. We have probably visited some of your nursery facilities where we're where we want to do our ultimate goal is to implement best management practices to produce healthy plants, and in this case, Phytophthora 3. So as you may be familiar with these best management practices, we want to implement a systematic approach for disease prevention, and that is integrated with the nursery production and practices. And one component of these best uh, practices is testing regularly the nursery stock. And then one question that uh, gets right, gives rise when we are testing is like, what is the most effective method for Phytophthora detection? And since we've seen through many of these talks, detection is a big challenge still for all researchers and people in the diagnostics uh, community. So the current methods that we have is the legit method. Uh, Ted Zwicky here is the guru of the legit testing. So I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but basically what we do in the leachate method is irrigating a plant for at least a, a number of plants for at least hour and a half. And we're collecting this leachate water. And then um, we are baiting for this leachate water to determine what phytophthoras are present. Another uh, method in diagnostic clinic is simply if you have symptomatic roots, you plate it in selected phytophthora media although we have seen in some presentations that we may have some false negatives where sometimes it's hard to recover Phytophthora from the roots. And these are the immune strips that are commercial that you can detect presence or absence of Phytophthora, and this is just up to the uh, genus level. So in order to identify Phytophthora, since we have a symptomatic pair, as you see in the left, or since you plated the roots in selective media, up to the Phytophthora species, it takes us at least three weeks. Because once you start growing the infected tissue in the plate, uh, well, you need to isolate it. And when this is isolated and purified, we do some morphological identification and mostly some molecular identification to have uh, at 100% certainty of what Phytophthora species we are dealing with. So we all know uh, people in the nurseries before they have their plants, uh, or they, before they want to get plant tested to go to a restoration site, having a fast diagnostics is something that the whole community uh, needs. So in order to test these three currently available methods and compare how, effic how efficacious they are, we did an experimental design um, here at UC Davis where we have coffee berry plants that were infected with Phytophthora cactorum. We have three, three different sets and we have a percentage, a, a known percentage of infection. So we have a percentage of 20% infection in each of the blocks and we sample at four, eight and 12 weeks after the plants were inoculated and at different and at each different time point, we knew which plants were inoculated, and we simply compared the three uh, different uh, detection methods that I mentioned. So, sharing some of the results we got with the detection percentage uh, with the leachate methods, we have that after four weeks that we inoculated the plants, 
the leachate was uh, give us a detection success with phytophthora as a term. I mean, detection success up to molecular identification where we recover the phytophthora species we uh, inoculate. And so we have that more than 60% for the first sampling point, but we see that at eight and 12 weeks after the plants were inoculated, we got 100% of detection with this method, which this is a, this method that we are regularly using in the um, air man and the air program for restoration nurseries. Uh, when we compare the direct root isolation methods, we have that the detection percentage was lower. When we had plants at four weeks after they were inoculated, they had the lowest um, success at recovering phytophthora cacturum, whereas it increased over time. As you can see, at eight and 12 weeks, we had a detection percentage up to 50%. Something that we're thinking with this, it may be as uh, the first stack mentioned it, like when you think phytophthora is present there, but you are unable to get it from the culture. So there may be some inhibition probably from, from the root exudates or that the pathogen is late in there, but the source for some, some reason don't grow. And something with the different times in which we recover the pathogen and the percentage in that we recover make us think over in the pathogen biology, which is like how long time does it take from inoculated soil and from the in this case, Phytophthora cacturum is forced to swim into the roots and infect the roots. So the timing, I think, is something that would be important to consider when we are doing uh, diagnostics. And finally, when we try the immune strips method, we have that it was very variable. The percentage detection, the percentage of detection was never higher than 40%. And one time uh, we didn't uh, identify any of the Phytophthora plants that were inoculated were uh, identified with this pathogen, so it was like the least reliable method. Coming back to the question of what is the most effective method, we have the summary of the three different uh, met methodologies we tested. And overall, we have that the lesion was the most effective at detecting Phytophthora. As you know, with this method, we test blocks of plants, but we are unable to discern between infected and non-infected plants. But as you know, if we have a block that tested positive for Phytophthora, the suggestion is uh, get rid of the whole block. Um, we have that detection percentage from direct uh, root isolations increase over time. And as we mentioned, this may be related with pathogen biology. And I also think it may change depending on the Phytophthora species you are working with. In this case, we just have um, Phytophthora cacturum. And the immune strips was not effective at detecting uh, the pathogen. So how do we incorporate these results we're getting into this uh, AIR program, which is the accreditation to improve restoration? So for now, based on these results, we can inform the program that the legit method, which is the one that is being currently used, is the most effective at detecting this pathogen. And then there are still some questions that we need to figure it out, which is like, what is an adequate sampling size when we are testing? And then uh, what happened when you have a positive uh, block? Uh, we have to do, of course, more testing from neighbor blocks and of course uh, destroy the infected uh, plant material. I'll be brief in this part. This is like some of the current and future work we're doing. As I mentioned, to identify Phytophthora to the species level takes time. I'm working currently in doing some um, Molecular detection with RPASA, this is basically a PCR that doesn't need a thermocycler. And so this can be applied in the field and can get, can get us a result in 30 minutes if we have Phytophthora present or absent in the plants that uh, we are testing. And so for that, uh, I'm working with Tyler from the Risa Lab who provided a bunch of Phytophthora isolates recovered from uh, these uh, restoration sites and some restoration nurseries. Um, we're working with Andy Salazar, our lab technician in the lab, and she's doing all the DNA extractions. She will do some spore suspensions to validate this RPA uh, assay in the species that we recover in restoration sites. And hopefully next year we'll move to test this, um, this assay into implanta uh, infected. And with that, I would like to acknowledge, well, my lab, this was our first picture of the lab taken after COVID like last week. 
And uh, we are a new lab at UC Davis. And I would like to thank uh, Susan Frankel and Ted Swicky, which I got involved in the projects because of them, and all the past members of the lab that started about two years ago, and the SWED lab, which is like kind of like my hub where I belong to. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one very short question if anyone wants to pop something in the chat. Otherwise, we can move on to a quick presentation added to our agenda. Matteo Garbolato from UC Berkeley has joined us just to give a quick update on Cox postulates and the dog sniffing project. So Matteo, if you would take over the screen and unmute yourself, you have about 10 minutes to give us that update. All right. Well, that's actually a lot of time considering <laughs> I've, I don't have a lot to talk about. So the first, um, the first update for for you folks, because I think you're going to be interested, goes back to the um, the first experimental study where we actually showed that these phytophthora uh, are being introduced in restoration sites and are actually moving out of restoration sites. And one of the issues, of course, was there were a lot of new. Mm, Phytophthora species host combination. And it, almost in every case, there was disease associated with uh, the isolation of these Phytophthora. But of course, one of the questions was, well, are you really sure that these Phytophthora are pathogenic? And so Ines Marquez um, was a student in my lab last year from Portugal. She, um, she picked up three of these uh, new uh, pathogen host combinations. As she picked, I, I, I can't, I won't, I don't, I don't want to spend the details, but she picked Crassamura, she picked Bigasperma and Multivora, and she, she picked three different hosts. And um, I wanted to report to you that in every single case, the results were positive. And not, not only were we able to cause disease, but also the plants died in a fairly short time. Um, the other thing that we learned through this experiment was that unfortunately, but probably this, this depends on the number of reps, the um, stem inoculations don't, for these phytophthora, stem inoculations really don't work as well as root inoculations. And root inoculations don't work well if the plants are root bound or too big or too old. So really you need to get plants that are of adequate size for their container for the results to be good. But anyway, um, because all of the results were positive, I suspect that as we move, you know, when we have time to do more Cox postulates, uh, given that there was disease when we isolate Phytophthora, the answer is going to be yes, these are, these are pathogenic. And they, they were actually quite aggressive. Um, mortality was started about 10 days after inoculation for almost every species. Um, this is the upgrade for the Cox postulate, and I'll take questions if you want afterwards. Um, I have an exciting up, uh, up, uh, upgrade, sorry, update, <laughs> update. The update about the, the dog sniffing project. So now we have two dogs. They're both equally proficient. And this year we moved to the detection in plants. And the dogs, the dogs are doing really, really well, especially, I mean, we can score their success if we know that the plants are really infected. And so if we, if we do extensive baiting before, or if we inoculate the plants ourselves, then we feel very confident. And strangely enough, the dog's also quite confident when, when we use good, good quality material. The, um, uh, so the results are very, very, um, very positive, very encouraging. We, we, um, we tested at least two or three Phytophthora and two, three hosts in pots. There are some issue with the pots and um, the issues are how to present the plants to the dogs. So it, it seems they're really moving a little bit the, um, the container from the soil. So creating a gap allows for the, for the volatiles to actually get to the nostrils. Um, so that's a little bit of a complication. Um, we also tested um, um, making holes in the containers and it also worked very well. And then we, we uh, watered the plants and that also increased the, the efficacy, but the, the, the results were, were very, very positive. And the dogs can identify Phytophthora in about a second, about a second per plant. So they can do, so it's, I mean, if you've never seen this, uh, if you, there was a video posted on the California Agriculture paper. I mean, they can do this incredibly fast. Um, 
So because we don't know how to present the plants to the, to the dogs, we also started a new approach, which is to pull samples, basically to go to a nursery and pull, and we're doing this now with the Presidio, and to pull multiple samples from, uh, from, a, from a nursery, and then for that batch, uh, see whether the dog can identify Phytophthora or not. So in order for us to do that, we actually had to, to run dilution studies uh, using a in, infected rhizosphere and diluting that infected rhizosphere with uh, um, soil that was clean of Phytophthora. And we got, I mean, 100%, uh, we, we got these incredible results. Um, the dog could detect Phytophthora up to one to 400 dilution. We didn't go any lower than that because we didn't think it was possible. So basically one plant in 400, uh, the dogs could detect it. Although we also are aware that these plants, the inoculum in these plants was, was high. Um, the other interesting thing is that if the inoculum is too high, so if we were doing like one in 10, the dogs uh, consistently always identify the plant next to the positive one as positive. So basically there was uh, a neighbor effect because the, the uh, volatiles were reaching the plant next to it and the dog was arriving in the plant next to it before that plant. So it was always stopping, but always consistently in the plant before. So there is this issue of too much, um, too much signal actually. Um, but I think that's probably an artifact of, of, of the artificial inoculations. So we're moving now with pooling samples and we're not gonna do one in 400, but um, even if we reduce one order of magnitude, we can do one in 40, possibly we can do one in a hundred. So that means that with a single sniff of one second, we could actually, we could actually test a hundred plants. So you multiply for 60, you know, so the time will be into preparing the product but the actual detection, you know, in a minute you could you could do, uh, oh my God, <laughs> I don't know, uh, 66, 6,000 plants. So it's, um, it's quite promising and uh, it, it's not 100%, but the, the, uh, the, the, the rate is, is, uh, is actually quite high. And, and I'm done, thank you very much. Thank you, Matteo. Steve had one question for you about the Cox postulates. Were the isolates tested recovered from plant tissue or soil? Both. So these, uh, um, I don't remember. So we, we tested both. So some of them were from, from the rhizosphere. So there was, it, it was the soil immediately attached to the plant that was symptomatic, but other ones were actually isolated directly from the roots and, and from and from the um, from cankers they were causing on on the stem, so I would say we 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 tested both. Now I don't know which one was which, but uh, most likely we probably prefer to test isolates that came from the plants. That's great. Okay, I'm going to suggest before we move on that I try to get back to some of these questions from earlier in the session and see if we can just get them answered in the next few minutes. So back when Steve and Linus were talking, Diana had asked, is the bottom of the roots consistently reliable place to find Phytophthora infection in a plant? Uh, to the best of our knowledge, we, we think it is. Again, as Linus said, these are assumptions. Um, we haven't tested different parts of the plant, but the fact that Ted's work and the reports that we heard today of leachate being a very effective way to detect phytophthoras. When you water, the zoospores are released and they migrate down in the flowing water. And that's the basis of our assumption that the most likely place to find propagules is in the bottom part of that cell or bottom part of that um, pot. Great, thank you. Then for Ebba, there were two questions, <clears throat> excuse me, that we couldn't get to. Ted had asked you, were baiting samples taken in a way to provide high root density? Um, yeah, the answer to that would be as much as possible. We really dug around um, at the base of the plants in order to get those fine roots. Uh, we didn't do any direct isolations from them, but they were included in the baiting and um, as much as possible in the extractions as well. And then also for Ebba, Susan had asked which species was the one that you said was a first detection in the US 
And are you close to naming any other quote unquote new species? So um, what we believe to be the first detection is Phytophthora baumeriae, which um, causes a disease on acacia called black wattle. Um, I think it infects a few other tree species, although um, you know, we didn't find this in association with really any disease in this location. What's really interesting about this detection is that we got a weak signature of its presence um, in the Illumina in year one, and we were so curious about it, that was one of the reasons we went back to that site where we actually recovered um, the isolate, uh, which was nice. Otherwise, it would have just been like a random DNA detection that we didn't know how to interpret. Um, as to the other, um, quote unquote, potentially new AF species that we found, um, the one that we think may be a new species is a clade three. Um, Tyler is uh, the person who is helping us with that because he is a phylogenist and I am not. Um, I wouldn't say that we're that close to actually naming it, um, although we are going to report it, I believe, as an AF species. We also found um, a Cactorum like isolate um, that, again, we're not really sure where it fits, if it's some weird hybrid or new species or what it is. So. Um, I wouldn't say we're close, but they, they were, are reported on in our documentation. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to squeeze one more question in um, for Amanda. Krista had asked about this avoid importing or moving soil BMP and whether it's been easy for you to implement at MidPen, because for her at the Presidio, they are having some difficulty managing that in their large projects. Well, luckily, the past few years, we have not had any projects that have requested the importation of soils, you know, for things like large parking lots and things like that. So that's been kind of something that we haven't really had to deal with. And we are really educating our staff that um, we need to minimize the importation of soils. So hopefully, we will not run into that issue as we continue to hammer that message to, into our, our staff. So, um, but there are other issues, you know, when there's requests to import mulches, compost, things like that. So we're really trying to make sure we do everything site specific and not importate, importate mulch sources from outside the preserves where the work is being done. So we'll often chip trees within the preserves and have that staged on site, or we'll use things like certified weed-free straw for mulch instead. Great, thank you so much for that. So I'm gonna save the last few questions um, just to make sure we stay on time. We're gonna to transition to a slightly different. Instead of these longer um, talks, we're gonna have a round robin update. So these are going to be about five minutes max and there's three different talks. So we're gonna start first with Janelle Hillman from the Santa Clara Valley Water District giving a quick update on pre-delivery phytophthora monitoring for restoration plants. Go ahead, Janelle. Thanks, Janice. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I manage the plant pathogen program at Santa Clara Valley Water District, also known as Valley Water. And there's, there's a lot of aspects to our very comprehensive program and phytophthora response, but I'm just going to give a quick update on one aspect today, and that is our process of testing contracted nursery stock prior to delivery and outplanting. So we currently have four nurseries in the Bay Area that we contract with, and all have agreed to follow the Cal Phytos Working Group nursery BMPs for plant production. And we encourage our nurseries to conduct regular self-testing of the, the um, plant stock. Um, but we also do our own um, independent testing of the nursery stock prior to delivery, just as like a last check prior to receipt of the material to make sure that it's um, following all the BMPs and is arriving clean to um, our facilities and ready for outplanting into our restoration sites. So we use the leachate fading test that Joanna was talking about that, um, as she mentioned, is highly effective and accurate at providing a result of 
potential contamination or cleanliness. And I think Ted's also gonna talk a little bit more about the leachate baiting test. So I won't get into that, except just to summarize that it's a non-destructive sampling method. Um, plants are assembled in batches, tested in batches, typically organized by container size and irrigated. And then that leachate or effluent is collected and then baited out for a result. So we have contracted with Phytosphere Research for three years to conduct all of our nursery container plant testing. And there's a lot of organization that occurs prior to actually arriving at the nursery to test the plants. And this is, I think, our third year now of doing this process. And so what we've learned is that it's really important to be organized and so we take all of our lists of nursery plants at the various nurseries. They're sorted by plant species, container size, um, location, which nursery they're at, and then also delivery date. So we wanna have our plants tested as close to the delivery date as possible to get the most up-to-date response. So all that information is given to Phytosphere Research and they have a Google spreadsheet where they then organize all of this information and they work with the nursery in advance to organize testing day to make sure that the plants are assembled into the batches and that all the testing equipment is on site and everything is ready for actual testing day. And we do provide one person to assist with Phytosphere and oftentimes the nursery helps as well on testing day. So this is important too, because eight days minimum is required from testing to when a positive or negative detection result is received. And then an additional four to eight weeks could be necessary if those samples are then sent to CDFA for sequencing and um, identification. So that's why we have to organize in advance and then backtrack to when the testing is going to occur. So our planting season is typically from October to March. And so a lot of the testing occurs within that time period. And I'll just go into our results for this last season. So we tested six days um, from October, 2020 to March, 2021. And we tested at three nurseries. We had a total of 91 leachate tests that tested a total of almost 3000 containers. So it was a huge effort spread over that six day period. We had no positive detections of Phytophthora at all. We're very, very proud of that. We're happy with our nurseries. We're proud of them. Um, it's just a great, great result for us. The total cost of this six day testing period was about $15,700, and that works out to about $172 per test. And the total hours of testing was 135 hours, which is works out to about an hour and a half per test. And we found that we can do about up to 20 tests per day, or two and a half to three tests per hour. And this is Phytosphere being incredibly efficient and really being well organized with all of this. So that's kind of just a quick update on how we're using that leachate baiting test to ensure that the contracted nursery material that we receive is clean before it goes into our restoration sites. Thanks, Janelle. I'm going to move on to the next round robin. We're going to we're being joined with by Jared Lewis of the San Jose Water District. Jared, can you give us your five minute update on what you're doing there? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jared Lewis, manager of environmental planning, natural resources with San Jose Water. Just going to give a real quick update on our work towards a set of enhanced BMPs for plant pathogens on our Los Gatos Creek watershed and our non-watershed sites in Santa Clara County. Uh, we've been working over the past six months on a set of BMPs for mitigation sites, uh, restoration activities for a forestry and fuels management program, and for general operations and maintenance as well. So these extend, will extend across the organization and include not only our uh, restoration work, but also BMPs for 
any potential sort of vectors for um, uh, pathogens on our on our lands. Our focus for 2021 has really been um, about evaluating our existing programs and VMPs and to identify gaps in um, our own knowledge and understanding, but also gaps in strategies for actually implementing VMPs. Um, it's been interesting to hear about others um, sort of perspectives and challenges in terms of implementation um, and certainly something that we've been thinking a lot about as we develop our new BMPs. We've also conducted a broader assessment of our watershed looking at tree mortality as well as potential vectors for plant pathogens uh, with the goal of better understanding the status of uh, tree mortality and, and pathogens in our watershed and, and risks. We made a, I would say, a really concerted effort to engage others that are working in the space. Um, we've had a number of really productive conversations with partners, um, and this has been tremendously helpful in, in our own process and in, in framing um, our, our BMPs. We're now in the process of um, refining a set of BMPs that are informed by this process, our partners and other collaborators. And the intention is to finalize these in um, late 2022. Um, in terms of lessons learned and challenges, I'm sure that uh, many on here can appreciate the challenge of implementing new policy or BMPs. And I think this is especially true in large and distributed organizations, um, which many of us are, are working in. I think um, it's particularly true with policy that triggers additional expenditures and maybe changes operations. Uh, and this has certainly been true for, for San Jose Water, the process of building consensus around our BMPs and increasing awareness about pathogens. Uh, in my mind has really been a fundamental challenge. Um, we've had to focus on education and really understanding as an organization, the risk of pathogens, not only to biological resources, but also around our, our core mission, which is water um, and water supply. Um, so we're really looking forward to engaging more with this group and to continue learning as we build our own program. Um, Collaboration's been really valuable and, and critical, and um, I appreciate all the information um, and presenters on this meeting. Thanks so much for joining us, Jared. I hope you make lots of connections and get all the information you need to make your program successful. We're gonna move on now to Ted Swicky giving a brief update on the accreditation program. Ted, take it away. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share a few slides with it just so it's you know, something to look at. Um, so we're talking about the AIR program accreditation to improve restoration. And a, a major goal of this is to try to protect native vegetation and habitats by ensuring that nursery stock doesn't serve as a main source of Phytophthora introductions. And there's Mateo and we and many other researchers now have documented this over and over in California wildlands. And this is just one from the, this last year where we sampled a planting less than 10 years old with diff, several different Phytophthora species in it. And if you look in this one area, you see this dead plant down here that turned out to have one of the same Phytophthora matching ITS sequences exactly of these Phytophthora that were introduced with the nursery stock. So that's the type of thing we're trying to avoid happening more and more. And so you've seen what's going on is where you were implying using these improved uh, methods to make sure that that uh, plants are produced in a way that excludes Phytophthora. And as uh, Janelle mentioned yesterday, this this program is going to transition to the UC Davis Plant Path Department. And it's really important that plant pathologists are involved in this process because it really is kind of applied plant pathology in the field. Every nursery we go to has got different situations going on and not everything is equivalent. But what we're trying to do in these different situations is evaluate the risk of each of these component processes that are involved and see whether or not they pose a significant risk. And we use this green, yellow, orange, red uh, risk grading system. My mouse wants to make things move back and forth. Um, and in a compliant nursery, when we summarize all the results, this is what we tend to see. We see everybody is 
all the everything lights out as green, all these components are acceptable risk. And that is what we're trying to do in the AIR program. Um, we, as, as, as uh, Janelle mentioned yesterday, we have multiple nurseries involved in the program uh, right now, about 14 in Northern California, five have been fully accredited. One is already in the recredited cycle. The other ones are in progress. And again, they span a, a variety of different things. And sometimes we're working at nurseries uh, where they're still setting up their situation. They aren't all the way there. No hell with that. Um, um, in Southern California, we've been uh, working there. I guess you got to go back a couple of slides. There we go. Sorry. Um, and uh, these are all different, totally different situations. Uh, this is a Forest Service nursery up near Big Bear, um, which you know, was somewhat embarrassed by the fact that when we were asking about whether they had deer problems or anything, they didn't. But we found this deer licking one of their tables there. And I'll ask you later on why it was the deer licking the table if we have time. Um, this nursery, the Santa Clara Rita Valley area, transitioning from really non-compliant types of methods and working on their, their BMP compliance. Um, this is the RC, RCD, um, and we're working with uh, Alejandra Soto and Billy Sale from California Botanic Gardens down there as, as our local people do, involved in the testing. Um, here training uh, Alejandro uh, with, with, in the leachate method for testing some of their plants there. So again, what this whole thing is about is the nursery probably taught their BMPs are really in a sort of a trust but verify situation. It is the clean production process that provides the confidence. That is the key to, to excluding Phytophthora. And we're using testing as a check on the implementation and to be able to identify it. And again, this leachate basing test, we can run lots of tests in a day, and it allows us to a way to non-destructively test large numbers of plants. Um, Janelle mentioned yesterday, we just got this published um, at in Plant Health Progress about the program, so you can read all about it there. Um, this table here is in there, and I've just reformulated it here to make it a little easier to see. But in all the tests that we've done from the inception of the whole area, um, in compliant nurseries, fully compliant nurseries, we haven't had any detections. Um, if you compare that to what we call partially compliant or non-compliant nurseries, um, you can see the percent positive tests overall are about 25% in these so-called partially compliant and the generally non-compliant a lot higher than that. And those are based off of much fewer tests than, than our clean nursery here. Uh, a little thing I wanted to add here is this is new data from this K nursery, which originally was it's still at best partially compliant. And uh, um, we did quite a bit of extensive testing there through some other projects. But the bottom line is um, there's quite a bit of Phytophthora there if you do enough testing. And in fact, we had eight different Phytophthora species detected, including one which is apparently an, an unnamed uh, clade one hybrid or new taxon. So again, what we want to really do is avoid these kind of situations where we have Phytophthora in the nursery and we're going to use it for restoration plants. So we're really, the program is based off of the Phytophthora free standard. We don't want to be moving these Phytophthora out into the wildlands. That's super critical for restoration plantings. But I would argue, and certainly Steve Jeffers and their group there is seeing the same issue. It's important in agricultural situations. It's important in other horticultural situations as well. So um, that's what we're trying to do. And I think we're on our way to making some progress there. Thank you, Ted. So we're going to uh, Susan's throwing me a curveball. We're moving into our last session, and Susan is asking me that we're going to. Um, instead use a little bit of time right now to congratulate everyone in the group for our five years together and the awards we've received for that. Um, we also at the last little bit of meeting time here had an opportunity to have a discussion um, 
we didn't really talk about how that was going to go. So Janelle, um, if you and I would like to try to figure out whether we want to have a discussion for these last few minutes talking about these uh, phytophthora introductions via non-restoration activities um, like recreation, et cetera, um, we can try to have somewhat of a discussion, maybe uh, lay the groundwork and have some chats. Um, we can also go back into a couple of the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. So I'm looking for any guidance from Susan or Janelle um, as how they would like to proceed in this last 12 minutes we have in the meeting. Well, Susan, I was wondering if you wanted to just introduce briefly the, the um, restoration plant health program at Davis and take a couple minutes for that? Or what were you thinking on that? Okay. Um, I really do want to say too much because it's a little premature, but um, we are talking with UC Davis. Um, we have a vision, several of us, to try to institutionalize a lot of the program for plant health um, that we've been doing and create a interdisciplinary Envir uh, restoration environmental plant health program, which would combine uh, restoration and plant pathology at UC Davis. Um, we've been talking and, you know, to endow a professorship would cost us $2.5 million, where it may be 5% success on raising that amount of money. So if people have ideas or uh, a you know, funders who might be interested or other ideas for that program, uh, please let me know. Um, Janelle, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that was a good brief summary. Um, I think you said it very well. So um, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Susan. Okay, and then really, as Janice said in my behalf, I mean, to me, listening to the applications of the best management practices that this group struggled through for many years, it's really quite exciting to see uh, how far we've come in five years. So I just want to thank everybody and uh, really take a minute to just say, wow, we've really come a long way. Um, okay, so we have what, five minutes. Um, you know, we didn't really set up something to get next steps from you, what you guys are thinking about uh, what struggles you're currently encountering, things you'd like to see. So if you have things, uh, please uh, let Janice or myself know. Uh, Susan, this is Faith. Can I interrupt? Yes, please. Um, I'm on the East Coast looking at year after year of Phytophthora remorum getting out of the nurseries and being spread across the country. I would love, probably not today, it's longer than that, I would love to hear thinking from Ted and others about why the BMPs are working for the herbaceous restoration plants, but mm -hmm. they're not working for rhododendron and all the other shrubs that keep getting shipped out of California and Oregon and Washington and BC to the rest of us. Okay, well, thank, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Um, it's a complicated situation. And really one thing about our, the BMPs that we talked about today, it's an exclusion program. It's a phytophthora free program. And so far it's really only been used in very small nurseries and is very difficult and expensive to apply to a big production nursery. So in some ways you're looking at apples and oranges really, and we would need a lot more work. Uh, um, but uh, I don't know, uh, Ted, also the National Plant Board representative is here, and Megan Abraham, is she still here? She might want to comment or others, but, um, Comparing the remorum quarantine to this program, you know, there's a lot of differences in the objective. And... Well, but there shouldn't be. The objective should be clean plants 
in all of these cases. And if one program's working and another one isn't, hello, APHIS. Yeah, I mean, the Steve Jeffers, what Steve and Linus showed us in Lavender, you know, that's happening on the East Coast, uh, is very disturbing and very, very similar. So, uh, yes, phytophthoras are uh, very damaging. If I could make a comment, um, unfortunately, many of the lavender major lavender grower nursery growing nurseries uh, are fully aware that they have a problem, yet they continue to send out infested or infected plants. We have a couple of of the primary lavender nurseries, one on the east coast, one on the west coast, that we have received samples from growers. Every year we've been testing plants. They've been notified by growers. They've been notified by us with letters. And um, yet they continue to follow their same practices. They give lip service to sanitation and making adjustments. And some of these nurserymen are our key spokesmen at the main national horticulture programs and shows. And it's an extremely frustrating situation when you notify a nursery they have a problem and they don't address that problem. And so I, I, can, uh, I feel the same way Faith does, it's a frustrating situation, but you need nurserymen willing to change their practices and, and address a pro problem. Yeah, I'd like to just chime in. And that really is where I AIR managed to be successful and get off the ground is because we are working with a motivated bunch of growers. These are people who are involved in the restoration industry and they see what they're doing as something that's critical to <clears throat> improving the environment. And so, it took a little bit of a learning process for, for many of them, but once they actually realized that what they were doing was degrading the environment in the process of sending out these, these infected plants, those that have really bought, understood that have, have come around and say, oh yeah, uh, this can't be the case, we're just gonna have to change. Um, if you're looking at other segments of the nursery industry, unless you have that same type of commitment, it's just not it's just not ready to happen so um it's it's a difficult thing because you know regulatory agencies aren't doing anything to really clamp down to that degree so it really is based off of kind of a willing buyer willing seller type of thing we're going to only buy clean plants we want people who can produce only clean plants and that market has to be out there for that to happen but you have to have ways to test plants to verify that they are clean. And unfortunately, we're seeing, you know, most of our end users are not aware of these problems and shot by price, not by um, necessarily how clean the plants are. And you know that's part of our message is to inspect your plants before you get them both visually and in this case, um, buy them and, and have them tested. <clears throat> and then you can try and reach out to the grower if you don't have um, good plants. But that's another scenario is that the, the nurseries are very helpful to these growers about buying and choosing cultivars and even giving them advice on how to plant in the field. And then when the grower reaches out and says, hey, some of my plants are dying, what do I do next? And all of a sudden you never hear from the nurseryman again. We've heard this story over and over again. We yeah. have some of our big nurseries, uh, ornamental plant nurseries that are growing lavender that have been sued and lost big time money. And yet they continue to send out infested plants. Yeah, it has been, and you know, I I worked with Jim McDonald when he was the nursery um, pathologist at Davis, and back when I was a grad student, same kind of thing was going on. It was going on, you know, from the beginning of his time there and beyond that. So, it's an entrenched problem um, in the nurseries that they have a tendency not to they they turn a kind of a blind eye to it because it's like they can't really be called on it. 
they are going to say, oh, you had your field was infested already, or oh, it was in our plant with something else you did. And so without accountability, without some kind of way to, to really actually enforce it, um, it comes down to market forces. And really, the market forces involved in air is that we have land management agencies that have perpetual responsibility over their resources. And they realize now that when we have introductions of phytophthora, they have all kinds of problems that will never go away. And they've, they've degraded their landscapes indefinitely, affecting their watersheds, et cetera. So that's where there's been motivation on both ends to try to, to address the problem here. Well, yeah, I think I, it's- I, I'm sorry, I, I hear what you're all saying, but I remain dissatisfied. And I agree that a lot more of it is on the backs of the regulatory agencies because the the market is not going to fix this. We've got different buyers. We've got buyers all across 50 states, et cetera, and so forth. We're not going to change that. But I, I as I said, not today. We don't have time. But I would like I would like some of you you brilliant minds out there to help me figure out. A, I'm not being facetious. <laughs> I. I Faith, this is Megan Abraham. I'm, I'm work, I work with the uh, um, Sudden Oak Task Force with the National Plant Board. Um, so there, there's a lot of different things that come into play here too. Uh, it's, it's more about the, the quantity, I think, of material that's being shipped each year. Um, and, you know, some of the, the, the issue is that these things go through um, different ways of being sold. They're, they're going through brokers, um, materials go to certain locations and then get rerouted before the regulatory community can even get there to them. Uh, so that we're kind of re relying right now on the best management practices of the nurseries. And then if you get a bad actor, which is what's happened here recently, or somebody that's let their standards lack, um, then, you know, that gets out and gets everywhere. So we're all working at the uh, at the Sudden Oak Death Task Force. Um, the regulatory community is on figuring out how to deal with some of these um, these issues, um, how to deal with internet sales, how to deal with um, you know the the brokers and when inspections need to happen, or you know. Those are all questions that we have as well and our concerns absolutely of ours. I'm from the state of Indiana where oak is one of our highest um, priced commodities that we have in, in um, our gross domestic product. But, um, you know, so it is. Okay, I think I'm going to step in and just, it's after three o'clock by my clock. So I want to just say an official thank you to all of our presenters today, Stephen Linus, Ebba, Amanda, Ted, Johanna, Mateo, Janelle, Jared, and Susan, and for all of the participants that we've had on today. Uh, there were a couple of questions we didn't get to. We will do our best to follow up with you via email later. And this concludes our final session of the 2021 annual meeting of the California Oak Mortality Task Force. Be sure to subscribe to our mailing lists for any future updates. I do plan to send out an email to everyone who registered with links to all the recordings and any follow-up details. You can find information on our mailing lists and links um, for perpetuity on our suddenoakdeath.org and calfidos.org web websites. Um, that's it. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day.